Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dean LeBaron, adventure capitalist and the founder of Battery March Financial Management, to Money Talk. How are you today, Dean? I'm very fine. Thank you. Well, you are in New Hampshire, and I visited you and had a very interesting breakfast with your friends, the pilots. And these were pilots who had fought in the Second World War, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, and flown commercial aircraft. And they were a fine and interesting group. And as I determined, had all voted for Donald Trump. And as you've also determined, which I should not say, they all have their handguns ready to defend whatever nation requires them to defend. It was fascinating. And post-election, from your experience, and you've seen currencies that have gone up significantly, and you've seen other periods of extreme exuberance. What's your take on the market that has been so uh, ebullient in the past months? Well, John, I am frequently labeled, and I accept the label, as an expert in emerging markets. And I was one of the few investors who went around investing in such places as Latin America and India, China, even the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, because we had an airplane. It would go out, it would get to these places before commercial schedules arrived. And those are the time to, to go that was when the prices were cheap. I know something about emerging markets. And I know that you can have a, a government which is dedicated to business success. And we invested in those quite successfully. My old firm, Battery Mart. And uh, then uh, when they get to be regular markets and conventional and the bankers move in, I would move out. Well, something that's very strange is happening now. I'm beginning to see some of the same emerging market signs in America. America is becoming the banker of the world, or will be the banker of the world. You can imagine that Goldman Sachs will be the lead banker with three people from Goldman Sachs in the cabinet. You can also imagine that it will be a very hardline government with three generals in the cabinet. That has not been true before. But I remember seeing these same combinations in emerging markets in Brazil, in Argentina. They looked like populist movements, but they were not. They were neo-fascist, governing the protection of the development of business. And the business people in those, in those governments made a lot of money. And indeed, we made a lot of money alongside them. I am seeing that happen again, that there is the early stage of development of an emerging market in the United States, and it's not going to be like any market that we've ever seen before. It doesn't make any difference as to what the earnings are or the dividends or the like. There are two things that, that you want in your investment. Number one is power. You want the investments that you put in your portfolio to be the powerful ones, the ones that have the voice of government and the participation in government. Secondly, you want them to be liquid. You want liquidity because things happen very fast and you want to be able to get out. Risk and reward doesn't mean very much. In fact, the Fed has pretty well taken that out of anything anyway by so completely governing interest rates. So liquidity and power, we're on a new day in America. I'm not sure that it's a very proud day, but it's a new one. And we, we can invest in this climate just not like we used to invest before. And of course, the underlying currency has to be dominant and stable. Yes, the underlying currency, the dollar has to be stable. And we have to remember that it would be controlled very much. A lot of the trillion dollars of infrastructure investment, which our incoming president has promised, he promises that none of that will be financed by the U.S. government. It's all going to be in partnership. And he is an expert on bankruptcies. He knows more how to form partnerships with other people's money than anyone does. So we're going to see a lot of bankruptcies. We're going to see a great deal of capital volatility. We'll probably also see capital controls. The one characteristic of emerging markets was capital controls. And we've already had that with our incoming president say, uh, listen, if you ship 700 workers overseas, I'm going to put a, a controls on. You can't put any, take any money out of the country. And furthermore, there'll be a 35% tariff on all your goods coming into the country. We're seeing, beginning to see the first light of capital controls. It won't happen fast, but it will happen for sure. 
And at best, if I'm wrong, which I, I surely hope I am, we will have a blighted administration, one that is not decisive, is all set up in factionals. Even the old Republican faction, like Mitch McConnell, who has been quiet for two years enjoying retirement as the leader of the majority in the Senate, he's come out very much in, against the, Trump. And that's most unusual. So we're going we're gonna to have lots of fights, and it's going to be quite, quite exciting. About 10 days ago, we heard that Henry Kissinger, at the age of 93, was in Beijing either as an emissary on behalf of Donald Trump or he was summoned as a consultant to the Chinese. Why did Henry Kissinger go to China? He doesn't like to travel. At the age of 92 or 93, he can hardly walk. People have to help him with the cane and so forth. Now, the simple reason he went is he probably gets about a million dollars of fees for any lunch he attends, a corporate lunch. His Kissinger consulting company is very popular, is well compensated. And so he can come back and just say, listen, I've just seen the Chinese leaders last week. That's worth a lot of money at the next corporate director's meeting. The, for the first instance, he's, that was probably a $10 million trip. The second is he probably does feel it, uh, an obligation, as known as the architect of the American China, China rapprochement under Nixon. It wasn't Nixon. It was Kissinger who put that together. And he feels it's necessary to make sure that in his lifetime, that does not unwind. So there's two reasons, pride and money. And we'll see a lot more of that in other people, too. Any thoughts on how Russia is going to play there next year? Oh, round? they're so happy. I have, <laughs> I have friends there, and they're writing to me and say, oh, it was the best Christmas we ever had. The, the, uh, the Russian dominance is coming back to the old Soviet Union. We're, we're, we're getting ready to pick up uh, the Ukraine and the Crimea again. We're even, some of us are even hoping, I hesitate, to, I won't quote anybody for this, uh, some of us are even saying that, that NATO is going to break up under the Trump administration. What a gift that would be. Now, I personally think it'll break up by inviting Russia into NATO, and it, it changes its complexion quite substantially. But in any event, Putin is proud of the fact that he can go around to any government in the world and say, I ran the last U.S. presidential election. You better take care of me because I'm a very important guy. And he's going to get away with that. And he is getting away with it right now. He, he is just having a, a ball. And we're saying, boy, you really did it. And we're going to be very careful about how we respond to you. We'll, we'll do it our way and our time. Is, but that, that's just perfect. So we are recognizing his power and authority to be the politician of the world. I should mention you first met Putin back in the 1980s in St. Petersburg. That is correct. I did meet him then and had a number of conversations with him. We were not friends. No one is ever a friend, in my opinion, with a KGB agent. And it, once, once you're in the KGB, you're always in the KGB. But he is very, very smart. He's very purposeful. And I think I know something about how he was selected for this, this job. And he, he is never, never, ever to be underrated. Now, the bond market has cratered in the past couple of months. Partially, I suspect, because of Donald Trump's own credit rating, but interest rates are going up and money is crowding into the stock market. And, of course, gold, which I pay a lot of attention to, has become dead money with the incredible strength in the U.S. dollar. Well, I'm assuming that interest rates will go to something like 4 or 5 percent, and that would be... Uh... Who knows what the inflation rate is these days? It's a rigged number anyway. Things like education, medicine, and other things are five or ten percent. But let's let's assume it's about three percent. So it's probably a real return of two percent and an inflation rate of three. Which it'll, it'll, we're probably heading to five percent, in my opinion. Therefore, we've got a long way to go on interest rates. So the, the impact of that is more going to be felt on payment of interest on the U.S. debt. And uh, that's going to really look like it breaks the bank. And we will do what every other government does under similar circumstances. We'll run the printing press. Now, why gold is going down, I must admit, I have no idea. I tried to figure that one out, and I, I have given up. I mean, it is, it is dead money, but it's haven money. And people are buying it at a premium in China, a premium of about $50 an ounce. 
Uh, they're hiding it under the mattress. The cops are coming in and shaking down the house looking for it. It's easier to have an AK-47 than it is to have a couple of uh, kilograms of gold. But nonetheless, it is going down. It may be paper gold is driving down the price and real gold is going up and tailing it, but I'm not sure. Dean, in 2008, during that crisis, the government took care of the problem. And in the next crisis, is the IMF going to take care of the government? Excellent question. And the answer is yes. The IMF is going to take over the role of many of the things that have been done by the United States government before. In the case of 2008, there were two factors that brought the U.S. thing. One is the strength, intellectual strength, of the people who were engaged in the finance uh, area. And the other is also the people from Goldman Sachs who had dealt with the Mexican crisis just before that. So this time it'll be, uh, it won't be the dollars that save it, but it'll be the conversion of dollars into SDRs. And that's the IMF that'll do, that'll do that. Well, it'll be interesting to see the second act of this play. And I will be back to talk to you in the new year. And I hope you have a good holiday and stay warm. It's about 23 below this morning in Ottawa. Well, it's uh, 20 by 23 wind chill factor. Here outside is reported to me, but I've been in a pool, heated pool, so I can't tell. Take care. Thank you, John. We'll go to the news now. And when we come back, David Madani 